Hi guys, uh, thanks for all attending. My name is Libby Barnes. I am the coach, the chair of the CO committee for the AIA Monterey Bay, and a project architect at Workbench, a design build firm located in Santa Cruz. Today's lecture has been sponsored by Granite Rock, who has donated today's lunch and allowed us to use their conference room. Granite Rock is a platinum sponsor, and we thank them for this. Thank you specifically to Keith, Katha, and Elizabeth for making this lecture happen, and for COAP member Selena Brown for assisting me with the presentation. Today's talk is both virtual and in person, a new format for us um, as, as we transition out of the pandemic. So, so uh, bear with us as we as we move forward. Uh, thank you, Shermaine, for providing our lunch today or coordinating our lunch. Um, our, our learning objectives are as follows. Um, today's lecture qualifies for 1.5 HSAs and will be submitted by Shermaine. Um, for those in, uh, here in person, just raise your hand um, at the end of the talk and we'll answer those questions. And then for those of us joining virtually, place comments, questions in the chat, and we will be sure to respond to them. Um, so, We've got our uh, learning objectives. Here we have our, our mission statement for the Committee on the Environment. And um, the next slide, uh, we'll talk about the uh, material pledge. So back in March, we had a presentation on the AIA materials pledge. Um, I, I don't know if any of you attended that. Um, if you missed it, it's on our website. The AIA Material Pledge is a voluntary program which any firm, small or large, can sign up for. The pledge covers five categories, human health, climate health, social health and equity, ecosystem health, and circular economy. There is an online starter guide to help you through the process. I encourage all of you to check this out. Today's talk will address the pledge's climate health category, aspiring for lowering embodied energy and demonstrating how we can begin to lower global greenhouse gas emissions, AKA GHGs, in concrete mis mixes. To discuss these measures and technologies through all stages of the design process, we have a great panel today comprised of a structural engineer, building official, contractor, and concrete supplier. We will learn as architects how to work collaboratively from the start of the design process to not only specify high performance green concrete or HPGC, but to ensure its implementation and success. For today's panel, I'm pleased to introduce Alan Kren, a structural engineer and lead AP with Rutherford and Shakin, a structural and geotechnical firm located in San Francisco. Alan is head of RNC's sustainable design practice and worked on the Monterey Bay Aquarium, among many other high profile projects. Alan is an innovator in his field and we're pleased to have him speak with us today. Also joining us virtually is, oh, well, Alan will be here in person. Um, joining us virtually is Brian Reyes, a sustainability planner on the Marin County Community Development Agency's sustainability team and is also a lead AP. Brian has focused his career on climate science and policies. During his career, he traveled to rural Cambodia, implementing sustainable agricultural training and youth empowerment programs for communities impacted by HIV AIDS. Brian joined the County of Marin staff in May 2021, where he currently implements and coordinates the county's climate protection, green building, low carbon concrete efficiency and energy programs and who helped develop the Marin County Concrete Code, a benchmark throughout the state for specifying low carbon concrete. Rob Nicely, founder of Carmel Building and Design, joins us to discuss his experience as a contractor who employs passive house design and building principles to achieve measurable levels of energy efficiency and comfort. In addition, Rob will talk about embodied energy carbon measuring software um, he uses to better understand the impacts of construction materials. And finally, uh, we have Katha Redman. Katha is the Director of Concrete Products for Granite Rock. She is responsible for oversight and management of the concrete-related technical services and quality control functions at Granite Rock. Um, 
That's my place. And included in these functions is the design and review of new concrete mix designs, communication with architects and engineers during the mix, design submittal approval process, maintaining knowledge of a broad range of current industry and agency specifications, and coordinating research and testing of new concrete technologies. Okay. So according to Architecture 2030, the built environment generates 40% of annual global CO2 emissions. Of those total emissions, building operations are responsible for 27% annually, while building and infrastructure materials and construction, typically referred to as embodied carbon, are responsible for an additional 13% annually. Of that 13%, cement contributes to 7-8% of embodied carbon, nearly tied with iron and steel. Its embodied energy comes from the intensive production process and carbon emissions from the chemical calcination process. Due to the quantity of concrete used throughout the world, we see the enormous impact it has on our planet. I hope that after this discussion, each of us can take steps towards reducing these effects. Right, so now I'm going to turn this over to the discussion over to Brian Reyes of Marin County. Brian, um, can you tell us about Marin County's approach to this problem and how you sought to resolve it? Oh, Brian's got slides for us here. Sure. Let me put that up. Apologies for the pause, everyone. Here we go. Okay, so um, going to talk about uh, just briefly the, our adoption and implementation learn lessons of um, our low carbon concrete code. One of the first in the U California, if not the US, to actually enforce it at the building, permitting, and inspection stage. So, um, just to give you a little context um, today, just want to let everyone know why we developed it, um, how our code was developed, and how it works, and how are we currently implementing that code. Sort of learn lessons from the development and implementation. Uh, so first, our big why is the carbon reduction. We have very aggressive targets here in Marin County, not statewide. We have a 20, 30, 60% reduction and a 2045 carbon neutral, which aligns with the state. Um, that's just operational carbon though, right? Um, here we're talking about embodied carbon. So the way we reflect our carbon emission reduction actions and measures in government is through a climate action plan. And sort of the key actions that you typically see are operational and end of life carbon measures, whether it's transportation, renewable energy, grids, uh, energy efficiency, electrification, uh, waste reduction, uh, in our case, uh, agricultural waste and carbon sequestration, and energy reduction. Um, we also have in there an important action of embodied carbon, and our big focus is implementing our lower carbon concrete ordinance. We see that as an opportunity outside the normal operational carbon um, actions that jurisdictions usually take. Um, of course, the state has economy-wide state measures, which kind of touch upon operational embodied carbon, but whether it's renewable portfolio standards, low carbon fuel standards, it's straight green building standards. Our climate action plan, our policy relevant, what we put forth and we're held accountable to for the most part, is all this is reflected within this plan. So if anyone wants to take a look, go for it. Um, when developing the actual code, um, we um, focus on a lot of stakeholder engagement. We need to understand the value chain, including you all. So whether it's already mixed uh, suppliers, the design professionals, from structural engineers, civils, architects, especially those contractors or general contractors pouring and also in the stakeholders is our government and building staff because they have to enforce this. Um, our code is very long, but what it kind of boils down to is this table within our code. 
And so here you see a table and the first column is our uh, minimum uh, specified compressive strengths. Um, you see the range there. And then you see the cement limits uh, corresponding to that. So we established uh, for uh, ordinary Portland cement our certain cement limits at each compressive strength. And you see have there in the third column the uh, calculated sacks. Um, and then we also have embodied carbon limits. So you have cement limits and body carbon limits via doing an environmental product declaration. And so there's two compliance pathways um, to complying with our ordinance. Um, the cement limits is what majority of uh, people or applicants uh, will um, follow because it's the easiest. Body carbon limits um, are a little more difficult especially for the smaller ready mix suppliers or applicants and businesses because of the EPD factor. So implementation, um, we adopted this in November 2019, and we all know what happened three months later. So we deferred enforcement until recently this year, January 1, 2023. And so we're starting to strictly reinforce May recently of 2023, partly why I'm here on the roadshow to make sure as many of us in the design community and building community know what's going on to the best of our ability. Um, in implementation, we have a low carbon requirements page. I won't go through that, but you can visit that. There's a link there, land on it. It gives you <coughs> everything you need to comply and all the uh, requirements. We, I also established a pre-qualified mix design um, page. So uh, anyone pouring concrete or ready mix suppliers, that is, that are providing, have an opportunity to pre-qualify some of their mix designs. Currently, we have seven um, listed um, from two ready mix suppliers in our area. Examiners and inspectors, their importance in implementation can, again, for you pulling permits, they need to understand the language that you know as best as possible. And training is ongoing. They must know the compliance forms, the verification process. I must streamline and iterate it for them. And they provide feedback because they got a thousand things to look at. This is one of them. Um, okay, and then ongoing building engagement and communication such as with AIA. All right, so compliance steps quickly. Um, before we call for concrete, there is a compliance form that must be filled. You can fill it out online and then really only takes three minutes if you know what you're you're doing and follow instructions very well. Um, basically, you apply our permit te te technicians, take it in, make sure that everything's all good. It's just one page, one paper, um, and they review the compliance form and the examiners place a hold and give you the permit to build uh, issued. Now that hold continues until you pour the concrete. And so there's another a compliance form um, that needs to be filled out upon that where the contractor has to provide proof from the ready mix supplier is, hey, that's what the design professional designed. This is actually what we poured. And so this is a little bit of a sticking point in our process, and I'll go over that later because contractors are not used to doing this. They just say, I want to get it and pour it and be done. Now they have to fill out a form and, you know, it takes a little bit of a mental barrier. Contractor has to submit either on the same day or within six weeks after the last pour. Um, as we know, a lot of comp some other concretes uh, peers will take multiple days, multiple pours. So we give a little bit of uh, leeway on that end. Um, and then the examiner lists the final hold and that is our only um, bargaining chip as it were in enforcement was is your hold can be lifted if you don't complete the forms and give it to us appropriately so that can delay the entire project. We don't want that to happen. Um, for non-compliant pours, obviously we're not going to ask someone to rip everything up. So building official or myself will make a determination how to offset that carbon. So as you build vertically, there's other things that we can look at to offset that carbon, but that is painstaking and we don't want to do that. OK, learn lessons during the actual development of policy, we got to examine the va entire value chain, especially those who in, in other jurisdictions considering this. Um, as we know, concrete uh, is a very regional project uh, product, um, so examine the value chain locally. Examine the regional context, as I said. Concrete to me is an opening salvo, and to many of you, 
all building materials have embodied carbon um, and an embodied carbon pathway in our code, even though there's two compliance codes uh, or pathways is not just about cement. There are other ways to do it, as many of you know, and we allow for that by providing EPD. So looking at aggregates, less cementation materials, optimizing designs and new concrete mixtures. Looking forward, just to let you all know if you're not clued in or if you're not participating, um, Cal Green has an intervening code cycle and there's a working group proposing an embodied carbon standard starting with large commercial development. It's likely that will move forward. Um, they're still working those out. And so just want to let you all know that's coming down the pipeline. Um, learn lessons in actual implementation enforcement. Building staff, staff capacity is important, so that's really my end, but just want to let you know how much work it takes to um, teach this language to uh, building staff. Um, education is never perfect. The best communication tool, as much as we outreach and provide collateral materials and educate everyone, engage associations, best communication sometimes is enforcement. So uh, by mistake sometimes. So that's the best way uh, sometimes. Uh, materials and tools that we learn are available today. So we hear a lot like we can't do this, this is not available, uh, you know, kind of here already, right? And for 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 a while. So a lot of things that need to improve are the practitioners. Um, we are noticing that our sometime recalcitrant, so adoption rates must accelerate. And this also goes with contractors who are pouring. Um, and then we also need more large scale pilots and use by these contractors. Uh, lastly, uh, industry and producers, as many of you know, are and have been ready. We have Portland Line Cement that's been out there since 2012. Uh, CNCA or CNCA, California and Nevada Cement Association, has a carbon neutrality goal for producers by 2045. ACI 318, they're developing low carbon concrete standards currently, which I participated in one session, and they're eventually going to hopefully push that to the International Code Council. Um, so, yeah, that's my presentation. Thank you. You know, hold tight and we'll have some questions for you. So now I'm going to uh, turn the presentation over to Alan. And so Alan's going to talk about um, his process uh, with specifying HPGCs and uh, I'll turn it over to Alan. Great. Thank you. Can we get the slideshow up? Because those yep. are my prompts. <laughs> um, uh, so what if, if nothing else, and I, in this discussion, I'm a structural engineer and I'm uh, hired typically by a, an architect. So it's a good group to speak to and say, hey, look, do my structure for me. And oh, by the way, you, you're in charge of the concrete. So I write all the concrete specs. Um, if nothing else, if, if, you know, in the old days, and that wasn't too long ago, there wasn't ever a structural engineer for the smaller construction, for say residential type construction, which I think there's a lot of in the Monterey, Santa Cruz sort of area. Uh, and the contractor, and they still do, they just call up the batch plant and say, give me 3000 PSI concrete and I'm done. Um, if you are writing specs, or well, if you're writing specs and you're writing your own specs and you don't have a structural engineer, or you have a structural engineer who really isn't say very up to date on how to green up the concrete, you can do something really simple. You can say, give me my concrete, it's 3000 PSI, and oh, by the way, I need to meet this total cement, or the, the maximum cement contents that are in the Marin County, uh, Marin County code, and you're done. And you will really have reduced the amount of cement that's in that concrete. Nothing else changes. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about uh, how we might go about beating that, if you will and actually requires a little bit of knowledge of writing concrete spec. So I like to start at the very beginning and explain kind of how things go. Let's, we're, we're one too soon, go back one. There you go. In the very beginning, so I'm an engineer, I'm gonna start with an equation, but I'm gonna write that equation in three ways. I got it up in top as a chemical equation, a calcium carbonate, CaCO3 plus C to CaO plus CO2. If you look back, you remember your chemistry, that balances. It's that CO2 on the end. That's what we're talking about today. What is that really? That's limestone plus heat makes calcium oxide and carbon dioxide. What's calcium oxide? That's the principal constituent of cement. Okay, so cement's more complicated than that, but that's the principal constituent. And the bottom line is like, look, 
we're architects, we're engineers, uh, we're contractors, we're visual people. So limestone quarry, you're too fast for me, plus heat mm -hmm. is cement plus CO2. So that's all we're dealing with. So what does that mean? Now, now we'll go to the next slide. <laughs> What does that mean? Well, it means no matter what we do, every time we make a pound of cement, we make a pound of CO2. So we can magically turn limestone into cement and we still have made CO2. When I say magically, what I mean is like, you know, heat from a, a non-CO2 source. So what are we going to do about that? Well, we can do, that's our problem until we find a new source of cement. Now, I will coming soon, calcine clay. Why calcine clay? Well, that's very interesting. There, Turns out there's clays out there and they're all over the world that you can calcinate, which is to heat up, and you can actually get calcium oxide out of it without the CO2 emission. But that's not really available at an industrial level, if you will. So let's deal with reality, which is the cement we're getting today. We're going to be getting that CO2, so we're going to want to use less cement in our mixes. How do we use less cement in our mixes? There's a couple of different ways. One is we develop or we optimize the mixes. As an engineer, I don't really know how to do that perfectly, but your batch plant does. Your batch plant should be able to optimize those mixes. But the thing that we do know is that we can take the cement out and we can replace that with uh, supplementary, supplementary cementitious materials, which today principally on the industrial level and the level where you're going to deal with is fly ash and slag. Now, both of those are byproducts or waste products of industrial processes. Fly ash is burning coal, so one day we're going to run out of fly ash. Uh, slag is from making steel. That's probably going to be around for quite a while. Um, also, and Brian mentioned the type 1L cement, which is type 1 cement with limestone. It's got about 13% replacement of cement with limestone, finely ground in it. So that helps. That is not as available uh, as you might want it to be. Uh, Cal Portland Cement is the only producer I know of California. There's probably others. So you, you can't specify what's not there. Let's go on to the next one. So I want to talk a little bit about a project. It's an architectural group. I want to put a pretty building in the picture. Um, and this is a project where we did everything we could to reduce the cement content of concrete and still get the structural concrete that we needed. So you may re recognize that. That's the Education Center for the Monterey Bay Aquarium on Cannery Row. We go to the next slide. That's a picture of the mat foundation we put in there. So that's 18 inches thick of concrete. That's not a thick mat, but that's a lot of concrete. Uh, and we put in a 50% 50, uh, 50 replacement, which was a combination of fly ash and slag. Now you can use both of those replacements together. And this is talking to, so you as an architect are going to say to your structural engineer, hey, look, I, we got to get the cement out. What are you doing for me? Okay, and he's going to say, well, blah, 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 blah. And you can say, look, at, why don't you give me a high volume replacement of concrete? Well, I've heard there's problems. Well, there's never a problem in the foundation. You know, concrete in the foundation just has to get there. And it's got to get up to strength. And even if it takes 56 days to get up to strength, it doesn't matter because you're not doing anything to that foundation for a long time. So we filled this up with a 50% a replacement mix. And right away, it's, we, we're at 4,000 PSI concrete. I think Brian had a 400-something pound of cement per yard in that 4,000 mixed concrete. We had 300 pounds. So already we beat that what Marin County wanted. So in your foundation and, and you know, mats, foundation, drill piers, anything in the ground, 50% replacement or more. And why do I say more? Because a, a, if you talk to your batch plants, they'll tell you, oh, we can do 60% replacement and hit that strength. Why do I know that? Because Katha Redmond in the audience educated me about that. And that brings me on to another point, which is you got to talk to people, but we'll get to that in a little bit more. So you got your foundations, 50% replacement. So we do the next slide. And then people worry about cost. Well, wait a second. Well, it's going to cost me more money. Well, this was our innovation. We said, look, Make your SCM your basic, this is what I want, your high volume, but give them an alternative. That's just 25% replacement, okay? 25% replacement, you know, at least you're doing something, right? And what I learned also from Katha was actually the high volume was cheaper by about 3%, right, Katha? Then 25% replacement. So give it to them as an alternate, you know? And, and if the bass plant can't do 50%, well, they do 25% because it's cheaper, because cost is always a big issue. It's the first thing people are going to ask is it going to cost me more money? 
Okay, so give them some. Okay, so go on to the next one. If we uh, down at the bottom, actually, because I hate slides without a visual. <laughs> okay. This is a different project. This is also for the aquarium. There's a lot of concrete in this project. That's the way we put the spec together. Give us 50%, but we'll take 25 if you can't if you can't do better than that cost wise. Okay, now we go to the next one. Well, we're talking about different elements in the building, right? So in residential, there's basically foundations and slabs. We'll get to slabs in a minute. But in buildings that have elevated members, the big deal everybody's worried about is time. How long is it going to take this concrete to come up to strength? Now, the high volume replacements typically take longer time than the lower volume replacements. So maybe we only put in 25% replacement, OK? And again, what we do often is at a 25% or less replacement, we'll say, give me the strength in 28 days. And the high volume replacement will say, give me the strength in 56 days. There's no magic to 28 days. It's just what people are used to. But you can spec uh, 56 days. Well, what about architectural concrete? We're exposing all of this, right? Well, the deal with architectural concrete, a lot of times we see this is no replacement. Well, what are architects looking for, really? They're looking for, and you correct me because we've got a bunch of architects, uniformity of color and quality of placement. The, the quality of placement should not be affected by 15 to 25% replacement. Okay, 50% replacement, the concrete acts a little differently in the way that it wants to, not so much place, but in the way it wants to finish. Um, but if you can work with the contractor and say, we can work with this much replacement and give you a good quality of finish. The color, the issue with color is you just need to use the same source of material all along. And every time you introduce another product, there's another variable. So people freak out and say, I can't put any SEMs in architectural concrete because I've got fly ash or I've got slag in there and then I've got cement and they might give me a different source of material for slag or the fly ash. Okay, now the same thing happens with cement. I've had that happen with cement. It's like, well, no, we can't get that cement anymore. We got a slightly different one, you know, it's still, okay. So you got to kind of talk that through with everybody and see where you think you're going. So that's the issue. So maybe if you drop the amount of SEMs to 15 to 25% in architectural concrete, you've reduced the effect of that variable. Let's go on to the next one, if we will. What about PT slabs? If you work with, with uh, pre-stressed slabs, uh, that's an issue because they're always trying to come up to strength early. It's a seven day. They want to be able to pull those tendons at seven days. Those typically have high cement contents, higher than the 28 day or 50. Maybe you can get away with 15% replacement. It's an issue. It's a true issue of PT slabs. The flip side to PT slabs, they tend to be a little bit thinner than the non PT slab. So maybe you've saved your, con your cement content that way. But, uh, and I think the Marin. Uh, the Marin Code actually has exceptions for PT slabs. Yeah. Yeah, they do? Yeah. Okay. Okay, whatever. Okay. okay. Let's go on to the next slide. I was going to have something else, but that's fine. Okay, let's go on to the next it's slide. It's going to go bad. Okay. Can we, can we go to the next one? Yeah. Okay. So here's what I really want to get this slab on grade. We see a lot of this. And this uh, is not a project I work on. You see, it's, it's an Eric Miller uh, Associates. They were, he was the architect, and I think Miller Brothers probably did the concrete. And these guys do beautiful concrete work, uh, all respect to, to our contractor and the audience. Um, this is where communication is key. This is where you have to start talking to people. If you're putting a slab on grade and you don't care about what it looks like, you, that's where we started with 50% replacement mixes, 50, 60% replacement mixes, okay? Because they're slow to go off. When you put in a high replacement mix, it can take six, eight hours before that stuff gets hard and it freaks people out. If you're looking for a nice, beautiful slab on grade, and they're harder to finish too. If you're looking for a nice, beautiful slab on grade, that's got to go off in a reasonable amount of time uh, so that the people who place it can actually be there and finish it. Okay, so you're going to have to, and, and then you really want uniformity and you really want that concrete to look good. Now, there's a lot of things that go into a good looking concrete besides that concrete mix, but the concrete mix is one of them. At this point, you talk, and this is the most important part of any of this, of reducing the carbon footprint of your concrete, which is communication. Do I, I think that's my last slide, isn't it? I think so. I think I got one more. Oh, I got member sites. I oh, forget about that one. Keep going. We don't care about that. So it's communication. 
you got to talk with people. You have to talk with your supplier ahead of time and talk to your contractor. What does your contractor know? What do they know how to do? What's their experience? What are they willing to do? Are you, you as an architect, you got to talk to an owner. You got to educate your owner what to expect. You got to get their buy-in. Is my time up? No, no. Okay. No. You got to get their buy-in. Think about things like mock-ups. Okay. If you're dealing with a new mix, think about a mock-up. If you have something that you got some exposed concrete, you got to look a certain way, you're going to probably want a mock-up anyway. So you can experiment with these things. There may be budget for that. There may not be budget for it. But talk to the owner, talk to the contractor, talk to the mix design, find out what people can do. Don't work in a vacuum. And make sure your engineer is doing that too, okay? Pick up the phone. And you see, I said, know what can be achieved, know what works. Email doesn't count. You don't email people on these things. You talk to them personally. And there's a bonus with that. You build professional relationships. I know I'm here because I know Katha, and I know Katha because I had a problem with a mix design, and I called up Granite Rock, and I said I need a mix designer on this, and I got Katha. I said Katha, blah blah blah. This is what I'm trying to do, and Katha said, Oh well, we could do it, but just this is. I said, Well, how are you going to do it? So this is how we want to do it. No, oh, that's fine with me. I got what I wanted, and Granite, you know, got was able to do it. So this is, in the, and now I'm here. So you build these personal relationships, these professional relationships, and talk to people. So that's my two cents on how to make it work. That's great. Alan, what, at what point um, did you engage the concrete supplier? Because as architects, you know, we if we specify if that project is the right one, you know, we have an idea of maybe who the contractor is. We have our structural engineer, but we're, we really don't know who's going to be supplying the concrete. So do you say, do you go to Rob and say, Rob, who's your, who do you like to use as a supplier or, and then you okay. have a meeting. So what's it's, the it's kind a, of. It's a perfect like question. That? Nobody really wants to talk to you until they have the project. Uh -huh. So I already had the project. Granite already had the project and we started talking. And that's generally what happens is the projects out there. It's it's too late. Okay, so we put our. It's not too late, but it's like it's late. We're we're in construction. Okay, yeah. because I've been talking to people for twenty plus years, I can call Casa up. I can talk call other people up and say, this is what we're trying to do. Does this make sense to you? And this is how we can do it. So the earlier you can talk to people, you know, the better. Um, but. It, in all honesty, it really doesn't happen until the project is pretty much on the street. That's just the reality, because that's when people will talk to you seriously. You know, before then, it's all for fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay. as early as you can, but honestly, it's usually once the project begins. OK, great. OK, um, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to turn this over to Rob. Sorry about my little pop ups <laughs> with the, my uh, team's notifications. Um, Great. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Rob Nicely. I'm the president of Carmen Building and Design, local residential construction company. Um, we, over the years, have um, our niche has become more and more uh, taking on very advanced um, rebuilding projects, projects where the the owners uh, have a strong feeling about um, the outcomes they want with regard to however they perceive sustainability. So one of the things we focus on is energy use in the built environment, and that has led me to take a start using a um, metric called passive house that some of you may be familiar with. It's primarily a energy metric, um, but when you start building houses to work right in terms of their energy consumption lots of other good stuff happens recently uh so the we've made the distinction now between operational energy and, and embodied energy or operational carbon embodied carbon most uh when people talk about energy in the built environment the most common conversation is about the operational energy right then taking on embodied carbon is something that has come a little later so, um, and today we're talking about the embodied carbon in concrete. Uh, so by way of uh, um, sort of 
getting into this. I'm going to use a, a project that we're working on now as an example, and it kind of ties into some of the stuff that Alan says. And like Alan, um, I too, at the beginning of this project, reached out to CAFA because we were, as we are getting ready for this project, which we knew was going to be um, built under this operational carbon metric, we also decided in this go around to take on for the first time trying to understand the embodied carbon in the project. And it happens that so probably you guys know that that um, embodied carbon metrics have sort of been floating around out there, but there hasn't been anything useful in terms of we've been waiting for there to be software where we could sort of operationalize it and, and Passive House, the, the Passive House Institute has put out a, an adjunct to their software which is called the Passive House Ribbon, which is a way to start to quantify the amount of uh, embodied carbon in your project. So this this came out, went right in the beginning of this project for us, so we decided to try and test it out. So the, the graphs I'm going to show you are the data set from this particular project. Just be aware that they are, um, this is our first time using it, and so it's sort of a beta test. We're trying to understand how to use it, but it does render some things that are interesting. I I started into Passive House in particular because when I started doing sustainable building, uh, you, you got into the weeds a little bit with people because you were just, people would say, well, why is this better? And you go, it's just better, you know? That's that's what everyone says is better, and I believe them. So this is what we're doing. So I wanted as quickly as possible to get to more objective criteria where we can quantify this. This uses 80% less energy or something that's a little less uh, ethereal than we just all agree that these are better practices. So um, again, I went to uh, because we knew we were going to be trying this out. Uh, one of the things that we we have been using uh, um, cement replacement concrete for quite a while. Uh, it is a matter of depending on what the application is, getting together with your crew and Alan stress the importance of communication. I wholeheartedly uh, second that. It's whenever you're taking on something new and you're going to be accountable for the outcome. You definitely want to have a game plan with people and you definitely want to have everyone on the same page. So in my case, having buy in from my actual people on site and having them feel comfortable with what's going to happen when we receive and place the concrete and uh, if we're going to have to finish it. Um, having some sense of how that's going to go because we don't buy practice concrete. Typically, we are getting paid for all the concrete we buy and it has to turn out well. Um, having said that, we do do mock-ups and we do, um, you know, as an example, if we're using 30% um, <coughs> lag uh, cement replacement, we will try and make an occasion where we can make a little test pad and finish it and just see how it is before we're really going to put it into force. So um, on this particular project, uh, Katha, I had I had my mixed design parameter, which was only that we needed 3,000 psi concrete. There was no other. There was no mixed design specified. It was just the only criteria was the, the compressive strength of 28 days. And so I said, what is what are the mixes that you have available that that satisfy this that I could possibly replace with? And uh, Catherine provided me with three alternatives. One one was 30% replacement. Slag, other one was 50% replacement slag, and the other one was some uh, percent fly ash. Because the, the crew that I have on that job was comfortable because they had used the 30% replacement slag before, that's what we ended up going with. As of right now, looking at the um, uh, hearing about the, the marine criteria, where we would be non conforming in the marine criteria, but if we had used the 50%, we would have been conforming the. Um, uh, just now we saw that the Marin criteria was uh, something like 280, 290 for 3000. The um, the conventional mix there would have been 372 uh, uh, CO2 equivalent. Um, the mix we used was 312, the 50% would have been 270. So at 290 or 280, 290, whatever, we would have been good at um, with the 50% replacement. So right away, we know we can get to that. 
um, just as an aside, because people know I'm interested in this kind of thing and I participate in various groups of you know, contractors that are interested in improving our practices, um, people send me mixed designs and I have a, a, a you know, engineer's 70% replacement mixed design that I've never done anything with. I also receive emails about carbon capture. So there's other things sort of out there um, being discussed. There are nothing that I personally have pursued yet, but I just want you guys to know that there are, that there is a vigorous discussion of what might be used. And, you know, I try to do my best to take a bite, stick my neck out anytime I have a project that that where there's an opportunity. So, you know, I'm all about as a contractor, my life is all about threat reduction, but I don't want to be so uh, risk averse that I'm not willing to do these things that need doing. So I try and find situations where I can do it with as little threat as possible. So I might try a really aggressive mixed design on a very small project if or or like uh, Alan was saying, if it's in the foundation, as long as the stuff literally goes off at some point and reaches the Compressive strength, you're probably not going to have trouble. So that's always an occasion where you can try something new and, you know, you can um, you can form up a little four by four pad and pour a little bit in there and see how what it feels like to finish it or how long it takes to go off that kind of thing. So that's typically what we would do. Um, so getting to my slides, this is uh, these slides are going to be the what's called the pH ribbon, which again is a is a plug in to the PHPP, which is the software that's the valves planning package with just the software that does the heat loss calculation. That's basically the backbone of um, how we how we design uh, houses that are meant to conform to that energy use budget. So what we have here is we have four different scenarios. Um, th these are for the embodied carbon only, not the um, operational carbon. So you have you have a code built house. You have two versions of the um, passive house. Um, this particular house where we're thinking around with some of the inputs and then the one that's um, on the right side, the much lower one, that's actually our passive house as designed taking out the photovoltaic array because one of the big eye openers when you start looking at embodied carbon is how much carbon is tied up in PV panels. So uh, that's um, the big nut that we have to crack right now, thinking about embodied carbon. This is the biggest single wrench it throws into the whole program is you have to reconsider your PV array. So congratulations, everybody. We have a brand new problem. <laughs> um, you can't really see it too well here, but there's a green line on the graph that's to the right of that. And you see all those uh, blue and red lines that are stepping up. Those are all um, passive houses or peeps in that paradigm where basically you have very little operational energy and those step ups are when you're replacing different components in that building. So say the HVAC system or the PV panels reach the end of their useful life and they need to be replaced. And that's when you get the additional um, embodied carbon built into the model. The green line that's going up in an angle is a non path. It's a, it's a code built house. And so the operational energy is higher. So you can see that where we start in the same place in, in the embodied carbon, because the, uh, the house that we're building has the same amount of embodied carbon as a code built house, the operational carbon starts to push the total uh, carbon footprint up over time because it's using a lot more energy in the operational. Next slide, please. So this is sort of drilling down into that data set and um, what you can see, the reason I put this up is I, I know you can't read those numbers and not, I'm not asking you to read those numbers. What I wanted to point out is, is that all the little boxes over there on the right hand side where you see something other than green, those are the places where there's a lot of embodied carbon. And in this particular house, we have very little steel, so there isn't very, very much steel, but you can see um, I'm just going to walk over and point. I apologize to the people that are not here, but this line here happens to be the foundation. And if you could read that, you would see that it's, uh, um, I think, 500 uh, pounds uh, CO2 equivalent. And it's sort of a medium. It's it's one of those things that has a significant bearing, but it's nothing near 
the uh, 30. It's it's one sixth of what the PV panels happen to be. So again, in this particular house, the big thing is the glass um, and whatever else is in those PV panels is driving that up. Nevertheless, uh, like as has been previously stated, concrete, steel, and other uh, metals and glass in in my projects, those are the things we need to concern ourselves with. And so um, again, as previously stated. Uh, cement replacement is the strategy and also just flatly trying to use less uh, concrete if at all possible. So um, that's pretty much it. I have, I think, uh, go to the next slide. This is just a close up of the, uh, the last slide so you can see where the things are. The dark red one is the PV panels. The, the pinkish ones above that are the, the places where we have concrete in the job. And next slide. And um, just if anybody's interested, this is the actual reporting page of the, the uh, PHPP, which shows that we're conforming in this job. And it does not include the embodied carbon, but as of the next uh, cycle, when they, they update the PHPP, they will start in, in having an embodied carbon aspect, and that will become part of the metric. So looking through my lens as just sort of Joe Schmo contractor, but one that's interested in this kind of thing. This is making its way into the marketplace that the ability to understand the embodied carbon in your projects. And so, you know, I I would certainly hope that that starts to make it into the culture that people start to pay attention to that. Obviously, from the regulatory side, as as exemplified by Marine County, we'll start it'll start to be um, part of our lives, whether or not we choose to be proactive about it, because it'll, from a regulatory side, it will become part of the program. But I also hope that um, people, other people will do what I'm doing and try and use it as a uh, differentiator in the marketplace, and that making houses that are actually better will be selected for by the marketplace. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ron. That's yep. great. Well, I'll have some questions for you in a little bit. Um, Next, uh, we have Katha Redman um, from Granite Rock, and she will discuss everything that we've, um, she, you will get more into the actual process of specifying and what is in these mixes. Absolutely. Right, thank you. Great. Okay. All right, thank you, Libby. Thank you. All right, I'm Katha Redman, as Libby said, and I'll be speaking from the supplier's perspective. Um, so basically, basic question, what is green concrete? So basically, it's defined as um, concrete that incorporates at least one waste material as, as a constituent. Um, so you want to take an extra step in your mixed design to make it sustainable, to make it longer life. Uh, next slide. So how does the supplier collaborate with the design team? Next slide. So basically, as everybody has a common theme, it's all communication. Um, and what we need to do is we needed to adapt to this new low carbon environment. So we need to take the embodied carbon as a new performance specification. So we're targeting optimizing our mixes around the constructability requirements. So that's always going to be the key. So in the past, you had the um, workability, durability, and strength. And to the right, you can see that we've incorporated. Uh oh. We've incorporated embodied carbon. So that's part of that wheel now. So it's kind of a, a four prong wheel as opposed to a three prong wheel, taking everything into account. Next slide, please. All right, so this is kind of the basis of the mixed design. So what you want to do is make sure that your concrete is going to be durable. So despite the fact that you're trying to make it sustainable, it still needs to meet the code requirements. Those code requirements are ACI 301, which governs. And typically, it's the exposure class that will drive uh, the requirements uh, for a particular mix design side. So here are project specifications. Um, as I said before, the sustainability efforts must be balanced by the performance efforts. So sustainability criteria um, should have a minimum impact on the performance um, criteria and the service life. Um, and then the specifications, on the other hand, should not restrict um, being sustainable or designing a sustainable mix. Next slide. Um, and this is our specification checklist. 
So we kind of want to go through this with our engineers as we're talking to them or, you know, hopefully architects as well. Um, again, as I said, we're uh, governed by 301. So that's going to be our guideline. That's our Bible for our mixed design. Uh, but we want to make sure that the spec does not limit the use of SEM. So it doesn't limit how much SEM we can put in that mix. Um, we also want to make sure it doesn't restrict the type or the amount of cement. And we also don't want to have arbitrary low water cement ratios, which forces us to have a higher cement content. All right. And then, as Alan mentioned before, we want to see if the strength acceptance age um, can be extended a later age. Right. So the more SEM you put in there, as you're hearing, the longer it's going to take to set. Um, so we want to have longer um, curing times. So we want to extend that out to 56 days. And again, that's part of the early communication so that it can be designed that way. Next slide. Um, so here's the impact of specifications on concrete kind of as a visual. So to the right is kind of a general concrete um, proportions. So as you can see, uh, Portland cement makes up 11% of a concrete mix. But if you go to the left, you can see of that 11%, 70, 79% of that cement contributes to the GHG, um, to, the, to the GWP. So it has a huge impact, despite the fact that it's a, a small amount of the overall mix. Next slide. Um, so here's an example of just a standard mix, so a standard six act mix, um, which is typically 4,000 PSI and a 0 0.50 water cement ratio. Can't see here. Um, so right to the left, you have a straight cement mix. Uh, to the right of that, you have a 25% fly ash replacement. So of that same six act. Uh, below, you have a 50% slag mix. And then we have what's called a ternary mix, which has fly ash and slag. So that's also 50% replacement, but it has 35% slag, 15% fly ash. So I've given some GWP comparisons. So on that straight cement mix, which is in red, that's giving you that 375 GWP. Um, going to that 25% fly ash mix, you lower that to 293. That 50% slag mix pulls you down to 271. And then that ternary mix is the best. That gives you 253. So despite the fact that you have 50% replacement on the slag and the ternary, you're getting better uh, GWP performance when combining the fly ash. Okay. Next slide. So here's kind of the path forward to concrete carbon reduction. So you basically kind of want less clinker on that cement, so it takes it to the raw material. You want less cement in the concrete itself. And then if you can, you want less concrete in those structural elements. Right? Um, what you're going to try to do is optimize your mixed designs and basically implement new design parameters. There are some barriers to that. Um, as I mentioned before, minimum cement. Uh, specifications. Um, so they will force you to use a minimum cement without allowing you to reduce that, as stated before. You have testing limitations. A lot of times um, there's bad testing out in the field. So what suppliers will have to do is overcompensate for that. So we'll end up having to put more cement or cementitious into that mix to compensate for the testing. So we want to try to eliminate that. Uh, SEM availability, as you heard, fly ash is going away. Um, slag could eventually as well. So we need to kind of expand and get some new SEMs into the market. Uh, design limitations uh, for specific projects. Um, different codes can affect it, as we talked about the ACI code. Um, it could be restrictive there as well. Uh, we need to educate our stakeholders um, so that they know what to expect with the new materials and the new types of mixes that we're designing. Uh, cost. Um, so when I say cost, I'm talking time, and that goes back to that extended schedule that we talked about when you extend that out to 56 days. And then you just need to evaluate the risk. So there's some real and there's some perceived risks. So you need to have the communication, you know, to kind of know what, what's on the horizon. Next slide. And here's just kind of an example of um, what I was talking about, about optimizing kind of new mix design parameters or new design parameters. So basically with mix designs, you want to use new materials and designs just to achieve that uh, cement reduction that we talked about. But here's an example of um, ultra high performance concrete. 
So in using ultra high performance concrete, you can um, make your elements smaller. So your building elements, your structural elements smaller. That might require two times the cement content because you would have to have a higher strength in your concrete to compensate for the smaller element. But you would be actually using a, a quarter less total concrete. And that would give you a net 50% reduction kind of in your overall GWPs. So something to consider, despite the fact that it's a higher cementitious, overall it could be better. All right, next slide, please. All right, new tools that are on the horizon. So we've heard the type 1L uh, cement discussed that Alan mentioned. So that's 13 to 15% limestone replacement um, at the cement plant that uses less energy uh, to grind the limestone than it takes to grind the clinker. And so that's where you get that savings. Um, another option is to expand the use of alternate SEMs. So there are several coming onto the market. Blended SEMs, whether they're pre-blending, maybe slag and fly ash, um, different types of fly ash. Uh, there's nat natural pozzolans. Uh, there's ground glass pozzolans that's coming onto the scene. Um, and then there's bio-related SEMs. Um, a lot of the SEMs are going through the ASTM process right now. So they have to get approved through AC, ASTM before they can move on to ACI and be approved for use. The ground glass pozzolan currently has an ASTM already. So that's kind of in the works um, and it's been specified in some areas. Right now it's only on the East Coast, um, but it should be working its way West pretty soon. Next slide. All right, and then here I kind of wanted to give you an idea of kind of uh, the different um, agencies and different requirements that are out there as well. And I'm going to get a little bit closer so that I can read here. <laughs> so the first one is NRMCA. So they basically have a national uh, national regional average. Um, and in that case, it's 247 um, of CO2 of GWP. Um, first Movers Coalition is more of an international um, organization. As you can see, they're very low, 96. So that'd be very tough to hit, but I guess with uh, their materials um, globally, they're able to meet that. Uh, General Services Administration is GSA, so that's a federal. Uh, that's at 346. They came out with their spec in, uh, I think, June or July of 2022. They just recently, as of May 16th of 23, decreased it to 284. So realize that that 346 was easy to hit, and they moved the target for us. Um, the two federal ones that are below that are basically based on the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, so those are in progress right now. Uh, Department of General Services at the state level, um, that's the umbrella for the Buy Clean America. Um, so concrete is currently not in the Buy Clean America. So that's got some steel and wood and things like that, but concrete is coming. Um, California Air Resources Board, which is CARB, they're actually in the process of re redesigning their spec, so they will have some GWP limits as well. Uh, we got the Cal Green. Um, they're in the process as well. I think their spec comes out in July of 24. Uh, as of right now, it's 566, which as you can see is very high. <laughs> All right, so that will definitely come down. And then our Marin County that uh, Brian talked about, which is at 313. All right, next slide. So here I just wanted to end with um, some of the tools that Granite Rock has for you to be able to um, track our GWP of our specific mix designs. So if you go onto the ASTM website, ASTM.org, um, there's a list of all the Granite Rock mixes and you can click on the one and automatically get an EPD. All right, so you can download and print that EPD from the ASTM website. Next slide. Um, we also have a tool that's called Project Builder, and this is specifically for you designers. So you guys can go onto the Granite Rock website, granitrock.com. Um, you see right in the center where it says Climate Earth. You will click on that Climate Earth button. Next slide. And once you get into this tool, it will allow you to build a project. So you'll put in all the parameters um, for your particular project. You'll put in your quantities. Um, and then it will scan the Granite Rock Mix Design Database. And it'll give you kind of a list of mixes that'll kind of be the lowest and highest uh, GWP. So you will do a one-time login uh, once you get there. Next slide. 
Uh, you'll go in there and name the project. Next slide. Here's where you'll put in your parameters. So you'll put in your footing, your slabs. Um, you'll put in the quantities that you have. Um, and you'll put in your strength requirements. Next slide. Next slide. Um, and then, if, like I said, it'll scan um, our database and it will give you the maximum and minimum GWP mixes that we have available for each uh, particular parameter. Next slide. Uh, you can hover over any one of those and it'll give you all the individual details. Next slide. And then it will actually spit out a PDF for you. So you will get a PDF that looks that way um, and it will actually email a copy of this to you. Um, it will also notify our sales team. Our sales team can reach out to you as well um, to kind of talk about um, your particular project. So are the four up there, are those four options? That... Yeah, so okay. where they may put in slabs, footings. So oh. each one of these represents that element. I see. And then it gives you the maximum and the minimum GWG mixes that we have for those. Okay. Next slide. All right. So basically, in summary, um, we're just looking at reducing the carbon footprint, um, looking at those performance specifications versus uh, prescriptive specifications. We want to minimize any restrictions and constraints um, and be able to utilize innovative products. Um, we talked about the 1L cement. Uh, 1L cement does not fall under C-150. Okay, that falls under C-195. So when you're specifying, try to include C-150 and C-595. And that way, once the 1L gets into the market, you've already got that available in your spec. Um, kind of establish your sustainability goals. Communicate early again with your ready mix supplier, with your contractor. Just get everybody in the loop early. And then take advantage of the, um, the tool that I just mentioned to you, that, that concrete builder. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. okay. That's it. Great, great. Thank you. Wow. Okay, that that was fabulous. Um, well, we're going to open up the discussion, and I'd like to um, have people. We've got people on the chat, and then we've also got people in the room. But I'd like to um, open it up to the people in the room to see if they have questions for um, for us. And you can just stand up, or just you don't even have to stand up. Just start talking or asking questions. Anyone have any questions? All right, go for it, Keith. Um, can we talk about the type 1L availability, what it is now, what it is uh, in the near future, and particularly the, this region, if we can be so bold? Yeah. I'll take that. So on the 1L, um, it's readily available on the East Coast. Um, here in California, we've got Cal Portland, which is in Mojave, and they are only producing 1L cement out of that particular terminal. Um, there's also national cement that's down in uh, Lebec, which is also Southern California, and they're also producing on YL. And I think Cimex also has a 1L. Um, there's not enough here in Northern California uh, for us suppliers to take it on, uh, but eventually it will come that way. So what eventually they'll do is replace the type 2, type 5 with 1L. So we won't be able to get the 1, 2. So, um, so if, if in terms of the components of the, the concrete mix, you know, we've got the cement, so that's coming from those plants you just mentioned, and then we've got our sand and aggregate. Um, where are those coming from? Typically, oh, yeah. My answer? Yeah. Um, <laughs> obviously, they are almost in quarry in the Romans. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> um, and, and there's a lot to be said about local aggregate and the um, the carbon footprint of local aggregate. Mm -hmm. um, it, we, we always say distance matters. Yeah. Um, the farther away that your commodity source is, the more carbon it's going to take to get it there. Right. So um, um, a green banana is not particularly green because there are no banana forests here, mm -hmm. right? So they all have a carbon footprint. Anything else on? Yeah, I nailed it. Okay. All right. Yeah. I got, I got more questions. Okay. Yeah. Go for it. Um. Uh. The ternary mi mixes. The ternary mixes. Mm -hmm. Can you yeah. talk about their performance and and finishability? Out in the field. Yeah. So I'll start. Maybe Zach will jump on as well. Um. But because they're ternary, so the slag mixes, as Alan mentioned, tend to be a bit sticky. So it's a bit more difficult to work. 
Um, when you add the fly ash to that, that kind of resolves some of that issue. So that helps with, um, you know, with the finishers as well as setting time and things like that. So. Um, yeah, I, I have a, okay, go for it. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. Um, I have a question for Brian. Um, I'm just wondering if he has any thoughts on how to get local officials, um, cities here or the county, how to get them more involved and interested in, in these, um, having these specs and a program similar to that. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. Brian? Yeah. Um, can send them my way. <laughs> oh, no. um, it's it's not only I, I mean, how do I say this? I, I've been talking to a lot of uh, other governments up and down uh, California about implementing something similar. Uh, right now, Palo Alto just passed one in the last uh, legislative slash code cycle. I know in Santa Monica, they're working on it and all that has been started at the staff level. And so um, whether it's industry or finding a champion within each of those uh, relative organizations, um, because what it, oh, I've seen others try to pass policy or, or legislation, particularly quote unquote green sustainable policy. Um, particularly those from the communities, but they largely fell because they didn't get staff. They didn't work with staff to get involved. When council and electeds pass uh, ordinances, requirements, whatever it is, they're relying on staff to inform them. Sometimes the community, but certainly staff. And if your staff is not on board, then I've observed that this that's where it falls apart. So. Um, it's a lot of things and it's it's uh, it, it is hard, um, but I think if industry um, as well as um, uh, someone within the staff were to link up together within your relative community, respective community, then um, then you can probably get something like this going. Um, the good thing is also, like I said, direct that person to me who might be interested um, because as part of developing this code, it was a grant with our local air district, uh, Bay Air Quality Management District, and they we created a toolkit. It is basically everything you need from development uh, of a code and policy for staff to pass this. So we make it pretty easy. We have a toolkit available. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, it's not an easy pathway, but um, it does take work and similar to the design professionals and the concrete people they have to communicate it's also community and government that is a, kind of a follow-up to that so when the whole kind of green building um into, into our area i know rob working together on these through us UBC, mm -hmm. um bonray bay branch and getting our local communities kind of greened up but it really wasn't until Cal Green established their code that everyone was like, OK, we have to conform to this. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering if and you know, we saw that Cal Green um, concrete uh, mix of uh, GWP, which was pretty high. But are they um, do you know if the, the people at Cal Green uh, on the state level are looking at the Marin County code? as guidance or establishing a, a lower benchmark for us or lower meaning lower GWPs. Correct. Yes, they they are. So I've been in there, as I mentioned in my presentation, there was a um, there's a working group right now with Cal Green. Um, is it but I forgot what the name of the working group was, but it's in body carbon reduction work. In any case, it's a combination of USGBC and some Everyone up and down the value chain of a building. So they're establishing embodied carbon, not just concrete, um, and mm -hmm. putting forth a proposal in the intervening cycle on um, on thresholds. You remember I, I showed you that table. They're trying to determine what that table would look like, for example, but for an entire uh, building project. So uh, that's coming down the pipeline. I think that's where 
uh, to your point, well, when we put it in a building code, it's like, all right, we got to conform conform to it. Um, and I think that's the best place to to put that. Um, I will add that um, what it seems like they're going to propose at least statewide. Again, this is I think it should be more regional. We'll see. Um, statewide might not be as aggressive as the Marin County code. Um, and I think that's OK just to kind of get things off rolling, you know, so we don't freak everyone out right away. Is not used to this, um, but um, essentially what they're doing is establish those thresholds. Um, and so, yeah, uh, there is work at the state level. And I think ultimately, if the state becomes aggressive, and, and ideally when you put in Cal Green, you're going to ratchet it down every code cycle, um, then we then then this might be something where, especially when we're looking at the whole building, LCA, like, you know, maybe we don't have to have these local ordinances. And I know that's ideal for a lot of people because it's standardized across the entire state. Um, but for now, our standalone ordinance was, is going to work until something comes better at the state level. Another question. Um, I was going to follow up. Um, how important was the Marin County's climate plan to pushing this forward? Was that really important? I just want to comment about it, what Sarah said earlier. I think that in order to remedy the. I'm sorry. Can you can you repeat the question? I think you were uh, just it kind of was in and out. We got some background on your office too. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Um, um, sorry. I. Um, I'm wondering how important the time Marin County's climate action plan is this process. Like, did, are there specs in the climate action plan and not help convince people? Like, hey, we got to do this with the plan. Um, and what do you think? So, and then, um, yeah, so I'm just wondering that relationship because a lot of cities here don't have like a climate action plan. Okay, I think I understand your question just because it was in and out and I apologize for the background noise. Um, so, yeah, uh, the climate action plan, as I like to say, is not is different from a, a building code or a requirement in the standards, right? It's not. It, the climate action plan is more what I refer to as policy relevant or, or a vision, um, though it's something that constituents can hold uh, government accountable to what they're uh, uh said they were going to do and or community-based organizations or industry who decide to participate and be held accountable as well in that so climate action plan i feel is important um, i used to work and do climate action planning for the city of san francisco as well and you know it's the activists can or advocates can you know wave the climate action plan and say you're going to do this and how come we're not doing this and so by putting it forth in a climate action plan, it, it sets the stage for other requirements that need to happen further down the line. Um, so it is a strong relationship and hopefully communities can start off with a climate action plan if they don't have it. Do the, the details get worked out with the code and the staff? Yes, the details get worked out with the 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 details of the code get worked out. Yeah, is that what your question is? We, yeah. Yes, it does. It does. Okay. And and we you know when we develop these codes, it obviously, like for example, our table thresholds, we worked with structural engineers with Arup and another local uh, body carbon structural engineer, Bruce King, and they help establish the technical analysis to where we set our thresholds. So. Um, at least that's what you should be doing is good governance <laughs> to be data driven. Great. OK, let's um, Keith. Do we have any questions from? Great. OK, super. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, feel free. Um, we're going to um, end our presentation just to let everyone know we've been recording this and um, we will um, have this up on the AIA um, Committee on the Environment. Well, website web page um, shortly we also share our presentation slides and i thank everyone for coming here and kind of uh, participating in this really great discussion i'm really excited to have this thank you thanks so much brian yeah thank you everyone
I wish I could be there in person and um, truly learned a lot from all the presenters. So thank you. Appreciate it.